So the funny thing was, when I first got here and I was, we were worshiping, I, this was down in the person's seat in front of me. I just glanced down at him and looked at it until then. It says, we must always give thanks to God. And I had to smirk a little bit. And then when John came up and said about praising in all circumstances and everything, it just, God works in mysterious ways because that's what I'm kind of speaking about today, about mine and my wife's situation, what happened to us. And so I wasn't planning on writing a single thing down. And this morning I was going through my devotion and I was reading through and God just told me, write this down. So then when I started writing, I ended up with two pages and I don't remember writing it so much, but... So if I repeat myself, because I'll probably get off on a tangent, I apologize, but I, I believe a lot of this wasn't even spoken by me. But So I guess the question I'm going to start out with, how many of you believe that God is in, truly in control of all situations in our entire life, everything, down to what you're going to eat for lunch even, which just sounds dumb, but it's true. Well, Tuesday this week, um, I had a very strong reminder of that situation right there that I literally heard from God. And it was, it was instant, and it was as clear as day. It wasn't audible, but it was, with no doubt, it might as well have been. Um, I prayed so many times in my life for different things, and I don't recall hearing an answer right away, or maybe the answer hasn't ever come, but he's always faithful to all who ask. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. And, I mean, if you have prayed for things time and time and time again and haven't heard, I'm sure that eventually you will hear because he is faithful. So Tuesday, late afternoon, my wife Karen and I, um, we boarded a plane. We were in Texas and we were coming back to Milwaukee um, after visiting some friends. And I just put this in when we were worshiping. I just wanted to say this one thing. So um, at the festival, I got to meet Randall Reeves, who preached on, on that Sunday. Um, and he was kind enough to take me and my friend out hunting when we were down there. And just what a great, great, great person. Um, we, we met him at the house and we had our own plans. My buddy and I, we had all, all figured out we we're going to go hunt real quick and then go watch the Bears game. Like, oh, okay, we got it all figured out. When we got to his house, he's like, oh, it's a 45-minute drive away south. And we already drove 45 minutes south to get to his house. We we're like, oh, there goes the Bears game. But we got a blessing of an hour and a half in a car with Randall Reeves. He wears his his faith on his sleeve, and what a great, great testimony his life is. Um, so anyway, um, we're getting ready to, uh, to fly, which I don't fly very often. I we're getting nervous, per se, but I just said a simple prayer. God, just guide the, the, the crew, the pilot, um, everyone that checked over the plane, get us to our uh, destination safely. And then, then I kind of I was like, I kind of hesitated. I was like, oh, and also, tr you know, guide us safely home from the airport to our house. So... Uh, we get back, and we get to our truck, and we're backing out of our stall. Our car had been, truck had been parked there for four days, and we made it maybe five feet, and then the entire front of the truck just dropped down to the ground. So what happened was, um, you got a picture of what it looked like, I guess, maybe up there. So what that's showing is the entire wheel housing broke, up, broke free with the ball joint and pulled out of the axle and broke all the control arms on the driver's side, which then in turn broke some stuff on the passenger side. And that's where we were, blocking a lot of vehicles in, in the parking garage. This, this is a six foot eight tall parking garage. So we're, we're there and Karen gets on the phone and we're trying to find a towing company. And every week, I think there was eight people that they tried to reach out to and every single person said the same story. Well, you're in a parking garage. We don't have a truck small enough to get in there. So. I mean, we're just, I was just like, oh, could you imagine all these people trying to get off? And they're like, oh, good, we can get home. And they came and get out. So um, they sent over, uh, th and then, then Karen called the, um, uh, the, the airline, I guess, the, and they, they uh, sent over a police officer. And they said, oh, this happens. You know, we've had car fires and everything else. We've got a towing company that deal we deal with. Oh, great. We'll send them over. So the police officer came, and he's talking to us and looking at everything, and um, and all these uh, woe is me things are going through my head. Like, man, this is going to cost a fortune. We should be headed home by now. My mother-in-law is watching the kids. We got to get home so she can go home. Um, all, all these things. Um, my truck isn't even a Ford. Why did it break? I mean, just <laughs> all these things. So that, so, 
so just then, I mean, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, police officer had left. Um, he said, I'll be back in a little bit. So here I am. Karen went to try to line up a rental car. I'm alone in this parking garage, no one around. And my truck's blocking all these cars in. And I just kind of lean up on the side of the truck. And I just said out loud, I said, God, why do you let, allow this to happen? And this is when I heard God. It wasn't audible, but it might as well have been. God asked me a question back. Are you not safe? And it just hit me <laughs> like a ton of bricks. And I was overcome with just this joyful emotion that I hope I won't soon forget. But um, not only did I get an answer to prayer, but I got a real life uh, lesson on uh, giving thanks in all circumstances. So what would have happened, and this has been numerous people since then, the story I've told too, is like what would have happened if this thing would have broken a half an hour before you got there? Or half an hour after you had left and you're on 94 going 70 mile an hour. I mean, the tires was, I mean, this picture doesn't show it very well, but it was, it was like at a 45 degree angle that they, I mean, it would not have been good. And then I also thought about giving thanks in all circumstances and just how it hit me, like, how would I have reacted if we were on that road and Karen would have died or I would have hit someone next to me and killed them? Would I still have been able to give thanks in all circumstances, and it's just, it's very humbling to think about. Um, so I wrote down First Thessalonians, th Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 here, but rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. God does answer prayers. We don't always hear so clearly, but even if we never hear, we should just give thanks because it is his will, no matter what happens. Thank you. Good job. Amen. Tremendous. Well, it is my delight now <coughs> to um, ask Josh and Ann. Is it, where's Ann? She's with you. <laughs> Josh and Ann, of course, are our missionaries in Guadalajara, Mexico. And uh, Josh actually worked with us here for a while when we ordained him into the ministry. Anne is the daughter of Pastor Tom and Alice Flaherty at the uh, City Church in Madison. Come on up here. And they have their two little boys with them, the twins. Very good. All right, well, I'm going to turn it over to you guys, and it's all yours. For about 45 minutes, then we're all going home. <laughs> no, we're going to lunch. Will would like to say something. Hi. Um, I'm Anne. This is Josh. There's Jack. This is Will. Uh, we'll start by playing our ministry video. Most of you know us and know everything we're doing, but um, some of you don't. So it's just two and a half minutes, and it's an updated one. So um, enjoy that, and then we'll give an update on how we're doing. Guadalajara, Mexico is a booming business and industrial city, home to 5 million people and growing. Although there is a lot of wealth in the city, there is also a lot of poverty and crime. Mexico's history is filled with idolatry, violence, and corruption. Its present, like the United States, is filled with messages of secularism, humanism, and a disdain for God in the created order that are further dismantling the health and hope of a people. Can this nation be changed? We believe it can be, and with it, all of Latin America. We know God has a destiny for the Latin American church that will shake the world when it comes to fruition. Jesus and Angelica Angel founded Latin American Ministries after years of serving as missionaries in Honduras, Guatemala, Nicaragua, and Mexico. Their sons Joshua and Jonathan have joined the team with their families to continue cultivating a harvest in this region. Our goal is to equip and empower the next generation of the Latin American Church with burning hearts, sharpened minds, and able hands for the work of transforming society and reaching the world with the hope of Jesus Christ. Our long-time vision has been to open a Bible training center, the Philadelphia Institute, to provide theological and practical training in a personal, hands-on discipleship course 
that will set young missionaries, pastors, evangelists, teachers, and marketplace influencers on their way to a life of impact and intimacy with God. Right now, we can only offer weekend classes, but as the facility grows, our ability to offer residential courses will too. We also pastor a local church and are becoming increasingly connected with other pastors and churches in the city that have the same vision for cultural transformation and revival. We work with these churches to do youth and kids events, as well as to meet together to pray and believe for the kingdom to come here in Guadalajara. Will you believe with us as well? Whether through prayer, financial support, or coming as part of a short-term team, it strengthens our hearts to know we are not alone in the battle for the soul of this nation and all the nations that will be impacted by the Great Awakening of Mexico. There you go. So... So that's what we're doing. We're working um, in Guadalajara trying to open a Bible school, um, starting out with weekend classes. And it's been a little crazy this year because of these guys. Um, and we want to give you an update on Will. Um, Will started having seizures in February and um, had an MRI that showed his brain was not developed fully. He was missing maybe... 30 to 50 percent of his brain matter and he was um, much delayed in development with uh, behind Jack like um, at 12 months well Jack started crawling at nine months and started walking at 12 months and at 12 months Will could still just roll and um, so that was in July and I was so discouraged and I prayed God please let us have a breakthrough with Will by the end of the month and on the last day of July he was playing on the ground and he started army crawling <laughs> and it made me sob because I was so excited and since then he's been making amazing progress he can pull up to stand his balance is way better and just in this month in September started actually crawling on all fours so we're so thankful to God and, um, and I think he's trying to start to say words too um, so, we're very thankful. Thank you so much for all your prayers. We still don't know kind of what it'll mean or, or what he'll need in the future, but um, he's so happy and so loving. So, we're really thankful for our boys. And Jack is loving too, but more demanding. <laughs> um, I left my Bible and my notes over there. All right, let me, thanks, Pastor. Appreciate it. <laughs> oh, and, yeah, whatever. <laughs> he loves his rag. All right, should I grab the other microphone or can I just, yes? What does that mean? What? Both at the same time? No. <laughs> I'm kind of distracted by your beard. <laughs> I just love being here with you guys. You guys are awesome. Um, yeah. I, um, yeah, I love you guys a ton. Let's pray before I say something I shouldn't. Dear God, I give you thanks for the opportunity of being here um, with your family, Lord, with your precious sons and daughters, Lord, and, and being in, in unity, Lord, in your spirit, and rejoicing over what you do in our lives. I pray that you would bless us today with your word, that you would speak, Lord, and, uh, and that we would just rejoice in your love over us, in your precious name. I give you thanks. Amen. Amen. Um, <clears throat> it's been a crazy uh, ride with, uh, with twins. Um, yeah, I thought I knew what hardcore was till I went like months without sleeping. <sighs> you know, you start doing things that are just 
dumb, leaving your phone in the fridge, <laughs> carrying the milk to the restroom, and you just, you, <laughs> you lose it. And, um, man, I, Don, Jesus wants to get closer to you, man. It's coming. <laughs> He's coming to you, too. <laughs> it's going to be worse for you, I think, than it was for me. Man. Huh? No, no, no. You didn't hear what I said? <laughs> oh, I love Don. <clears throat> A few weeks ago, I was, uh, I was in this meeting, and it's one of those meetings that, you know when you're somewhere that you just, you don't belong, you're like way above your head, and you're like, oh my gosh, I hope these guys don't realize that I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> you ever been there? <laughs> well, I was in one of those meetings, and, uh, and I'm talking with some guys, and they're like pros in their field, legally and financially, nationally and internationally, and, and they're like talking about different stuff, and, and there's this one deal I was like, hey, this might work out, and they brought me forward, and anyways, they're coaching me before I talk to this huge, like, guy in charge of his area, and I'm way over my head. There's, like, millionaires over your head, and there's billionaires over your head. This guy was billionaires over my head, and they're coaching me, and they're talking to me, and one of the guys goes, hey, if, uh, if this thing works out, um, what are you going to do? And I was like, well, you know, a minister, a pastor, I, I want to use that for ministry and all these other things and whatnot. And, and he goes, uh, uh, he stops me right there and he goes, hold on a second. Let me, let me just stop this. I mean, these guys are coaching me. This is high level stuff. And he's like, let me stop you for a second. And, you know, you never know when God's going to talk to you and he's going to tell you something. And you never know who he's going to do it through. And he says, you know, back in the day, there was a time when, 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 a, when a priest would die and a new priest would come in. This new priest would oftentimes interpret the law and establish the practice of the law in a certain way t- as to fit the community of God. And so every now and then, you know, the law would kind of slightly, the interpretation and how it was applied, it would change depending on the priest, the high priest that was um, in order of that time. And he said, um, I think you're missing the point here. It's like, you're not under the old priesthood, he said. You are serving under Christ's priesthood. And I'm like, okay. And he goes, in Christ, he is the priest that serves under the order of Melchizedek. Do you guys know who Melchizedek is? Yeah, you guys, so you guys mostly are familiar with... with uh, with him being the king of righteousness, the king over, over peace. And he goes, Christ came to serve as a priest and a king. And that started turning wheels in my head. You ever heard, <laughs> you ever heard a, uh, something and it just didn't, it didn't register in your head till much, much later, like embarrassingly later? Yeah? Or even worse, like you have a really good idea and you tell your boss or your, your, your supervisor or whatever about it. They're like, mm, yeah, okay. And then a few weeks later, he's like, oh my gosh, I just had this great idea. Let me tell you about it. And it's the same one you told him? <laughs> this, I had that moment right there where I was like, oh my goodness, I've been missing something and I really need to share this with you guys. It hit me to the core about what I'm doing. You see, we're at a school in Mexico. We're trying to, to raise up missionaries to go into to, to the mission field. And, and a lot of missionaries are being sent out to Muslim area countries and all these really kind of highly and dangerous areas and hard to reach. And God's doing awesome and amazing things. But I was missing half the picture. And I didn't really notice that until God pointed it out. You see, there, was a, there, were, there were things that the priest couldn't do that the king was supposed to do. A king was supposed to go and fight for his people, defend the nation, maintain its borders, and grow his influence. A king could have uh, 
inheritance, lands, and, 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 and businesses and whatnot, but a priest couldn't. A priest in the Old Testament was not allowed to share in the inheritance when God divided the land and gave it to the different tribes. Because a priest was supposed to serve the people, and his inheritance was supposed to come from the people, the very nation. We live in a country where we've established an order for our society. Where we say, hey, the church doesn't mess with the state, and the state doesn't mess with the church. And I think we're starting to suffer the consequences of that mindset. Because we think that God shouldn't be involved in our everyday lives. We've somehow like separated the fact that everything we do is spiritual into God. There is no separation of church and state in God's kingdom. We live in a society where we polarize ourselves so much that we say, oh no, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, I'm white, I'm black, I'm a white male, I'm a black woman, I'm this, I'm that. Guys, our identity has to be in the fact that we are Christ first. We are Christ first. First Peter uh, two nine. Can we put that up, please? First Peter two nine. Yeah, tell him to stop touching his beard, please. <laughs> Christ has told you and me this, and I've missed this point for so long. And I want you guys. Actually, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to hear the apostle tell you you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You ever had, you can open your eyes, you ever had issues with identity? Christ, if you believe Christ lived, then you know he died. And if he died, then you know that he paid with blood, with his blood, the price to call you his son, his daughter. You know what that makes you? Royalty. Before God, you are royalty. Here I am sitting in this meeting thinking I'm a no one, and God's just telling me, hey son, you're my son. You're sitting in this meeting. Guys, you are royalty. There was a time when we pledged allegiance to the flag. I remember that every Monday. Every day you wake up, your blood is pledged to Christ. Your allegiance is in him. Everything you do and say reflects him. Stop thinking... I'm, you know, I'm poor. I'm, I'm, I'm handicapped. I'm not smart enough. You, are, it doesn't matter. You're the son of a king. Who cares if you're dumb? You're still the son of the king. <laughs> you got it made. Not just that. Your dad's not just the most influential person in the world. He put you together, and he made this whole existence in which you are to fit in. I look at my son, both of them, and sometimes I see him do things and I'm like, oh Lord, please forgive me. Because um, I know some of these impulses where they come from. Jack the other day was mad at mom for something, I don't remember what, but she told me that. He came up to her and he was like, wanted to hit her in the knee, and she gave him that stern look, no, you don't do that. And he goes, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh I know where that comes from violent tendencies God has placed desires in your heart that he knows are his you know we ask to see God oftentimes in our lives <laughs> and it just dawned on me 
God's like, look in the mirror. I'm right there. You are my reflection. You are my image. Guys, we live. We live in this area, in this territory. And you know what? We're supposed to invade it. Not by being closet Christians, but by just being light. You have nothing else to do. Just be God's son. When you wake up, don't compromise with foreign kings like all the kings of the Old Testament did. Your allegiance is owed to one person and one person only. Not because you're his slave or his servant, but because you are his child. It's your birthright. If you are born again, it is your birthright. You are a royal, a royal priesthood. And now the limitations that the priests had, you don't have them. The limitations that the king used to have, you don't have them. God said, you are mine because he picked you out when he weaved you in your parents' womb. And we think we're suffering a crisis in our country because of laws? No. It's because we've lost the principles on which our laws were based. Laws always follow morality. That scripture you were sharing, brother, um, I was actually going to share it too. You know how you don't dilute your allegiance to God? You know how you don't dilute how not to dilute yourself, your image, your identity before God? It's really simple. Hebrews 10:12. It's really easy. We don't offer sacrifices of animals or things anymore or pledges. But Hebrews, <laughs> Hebrews 10, 12, do we have it? You guys, stop touching his beard. <laughs> I just, it fell on me like a ton of bricks. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Nope, that's not the one. Hebrews, just let me go old school on this. Sorry. By the way, you know the best place to have your Bible? is memorized. <laughs> the worst part is I learned it in Spanish. When I preach in English, I have to go back to Spanish. And I mix up my, my verses. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, if you have God's mercy, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is, I'm going to Romans 12. I'm, 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 I want to reiterate this point. Holy and pleasing to God. You know, in the kingdom, you have a chore to do. As royalty, you have a task that you need to carry on. <laughs> and God doesn't allow, we look at a lot of royal families. Actually, just let me make sure. To what time do we have to let everyone lose? 11. Oh, great. Yes. I just I feel really excited. <laughs> Because uh, this has been huge in my heart, and I, I want to make sure I respect the time. Um, yeah, amen. Amen. Let's do this. Um, when you're royalty, it's not like the king dictates or he's going to tell you, I mean, you know, hey, you have to do this with your life. You have to do that. When you are a, a royal child of the king, you get this luxury of saying, you know what? Let's see what I want to do in the kingdom. I could join the army, I guess. I could go into social services. I could do this. I could do that. <coughs> All you really have to worry about is fulfilling your king's desires to expand the kingdom, to strengthen the nation. How many of you guys have had ever dreams and you've thought, man, if I could, at least I do. This is how it works in my head. If I was the dictator, uh, the United States, 
I'd take over the rest of America, and then I'd impose God's holy laws. <laughs> you know, I'd put all these little social systems to cut down on corruption. Oh, man, I wish we could do this. Man, I wish we could do that. And then I realized God's actually placed those thoughts in there. Not the dictator thought, but the thoughts about wanting to help society in there for a reason. Because I have the power to do something about it. It's the same thing with you guys. Have you ever thought, man, the church should be doing this, or man, I wish somebody was doing this or that project? You ever thought about something like that? You know, we get mad oftentimes at authorities because they don't do enough. Our, our, our representatives, our, our state, our, our, our leaders of our country, because, ah, oh, they should be doing this, they should be doing that. Um, how do you think you should feel knowing that you are the image of God, of your king. Maybe the ones that are slacking off is us. And God still has mercy. He's like, come on, son, just try it. Don't be afraid. Just try it. Just go ahead. Start that program. Start getting involved. Start doing this or start doing that. Guys, this world suffers violence because it is waiting for the manifestation of the children of God. This world is just waiting for you to light up. You are the salt. You are the light. You know how salt works? It only works by one way, direct contact. You don't grab the salt and put it next to your, your plate and say, okay, that feels good right there. I like how that tastes. Nope. Or who does that? No, nah, I didn't think so. You have to grab that salt and you have to pour it in there. It has to come in direct contact with what you're doing. You are that salt. You're supposed to be put right on the spot, right on the money. That's where you belong. And you know how salt loses its saltiness? You just add dirt. You add earth to it. You just pollute it. And you know what it's good for then? Yeah, you guys do. You throw it on your streets every winter. It's good for nothing but to be stepped on by the world. It's all you're good for at that point. If you've diluted your identity in Christ by your opinions of what you think the world should be like, there's only one way to sort that out. It's right here. You know what the king had to do back in the day when he took the throne? In the Old Testament, there wasn't much that was told that the king had or hadn't do. There were some general principles that were understood. But one of the things was he had to write down the whole law and become a student of it. That was his duty. See, the king was not above the law. The king was not even above his brethren. The Bible talks that whenever they should pick a king, they should pick him from among his brethren. Guys, we're not above this law. We're actually under it. We're submitted to it. And this law is the very law that gives us life, that tells you how things work out in this world. See, we, we have this idea that science, that science somehow is a new sacred method that tells us how this world exists. Let me tell you something. Science only tries to explain what's already happening in a natural realm, that which it can measure. <clears throat> it uses six different steps. And when you look at what each one of these six different steps require, you realize something. Science is but a branch of philosophy because you need reason and you need logic to make science work. How many of you guys know that reason and logic can be perverted? Just look at our political system. We use all sorts of lies and deceit to make people think this way, think that way. Again, heaven and earth shall pass, but this will remain. This is our law. This is the word of our king that he's given each and every one of us to live by, to be the salt. This is how we will sort out our opinions from reality. From the only reality that we can truly enjoy in Christ. 
we have, all of us, and I include myself, allowed ourselves and our opinions to be sprinkled with a little earth here and there in our salt. Sprinkle a little more, sprinkle a little more. Some of the salt is pinched and thrown out, sprinkle a little bit more. And we start letting our opinions cloud our view of what God is doing in our lives. Guys, we can't do that anymore. We are called to be in Christ. <coughs> Hebrews 13.5 One, it just fences. One, I'm either just having a bad day. Well, actually, I've been pretty sick for a while, but yeah. Okay, here we go. Finally got it. Hebrews 13:5. Keep your eyes free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Back in the Old Testament, the king was actually told not to do three things. He was told not to amass a ton of horses, because back then horses were something you could use to make your army great and more powerful and multiply your military force. And God wanted his kings to always trust in God himself. And he would tell them not to get a ton of wives, because though they would pervert his heart, and he told them not to amass a ton of money. I think that's one of the issues we have today in our church. We want, we have this unhealthy relationship with money. And it's all th permeated throughout our culture. Listen, I'm not saying money's wrong. I'm not saying that if you have a nice saving, if you've done some wise financial choices, I'm not saying that that is bad or wrong. I'm just saying, if that becomes your life's pursuit, you've pledged your allegiance to someone other than the king. The king doesn't have to worry about money. He worries about his people. You know something really interesting that happened when Abraham went out and then King Melchizedek went out to meet him after he rescued Lot and, and his whole family from, from those five kings? The Bible says that Melchizedek came over and prepared a banquet for him. And he sat down and was enjoying that presence with Melchizedek. And then you know what happens? That coward king of Salem that lost all his people comes prancing over and he's like, hey, Abraham, first thing he comes to do is interrupt your time with God with quote-unquote important business. To interrupt your time with God. Guys, always look for that intimacy with God. You might think that healing is the greatest miracle you'll see. You might think that being raised up from the dead is the biggest miracle you'll see. The biggest miracle you'll ever have is intimacy personally with God. That is the biggest miracle you'll ever have. That will drive love all around you. That will change everything. And the king of Salem comes over to Abraham, and he's like, hey, hey, i got to talk to you. Abraham's like, what? He's like, you know what? In the Hebrew, it tells him, you keep the gold, I'll keep the souls. Which is, I think is something really deep. You keep the gold, I'll keep the souls. He tells you, you've only got two options. Satan's going to try to lie to you and tell you that the options that you have are different from the ones that you actually possess. But Abraham knew this. So he tells him, you know what? I don't care for any of them. You keep the money. You keep the souls. I don't want anybody ever saying that I benefited from you. The only person you should benefit is from God himself. From God himself. Many times as pastors, we might think, oh, the holy thing is to say, no, Satan, you keep the money and I'll keep the souls. I'm going to save people for God. Nah, nah. You really want to save people for God? Spend time with God. Spend time with God. The more time you spend with him, the more you will emanate his glory. The more people will see God, not you. 
the more you will become the very image you were created to become. The more the royal blood in you will come out and take its form that it's due. <coughs> Before I came in a, in a ministry, I, I mean, many of you guys know, I didn't want to come into... I didn't want to be a missionary. I didn't want to be a pastor. Um, I thought I, I knew better. Um, and I told God, yeah, I'll go. I'll serve you if you change my heart, if you change my mind. Because um, I, I knew missionaries were really missionaries. Christians were kind of difficult to deal with. And I was like, no, nope, I, I want none of that. <laughs> but I told God this one thing. And it doesn't sound very American, because here we're all about pursue your dreams, do what you love. But I told God, hey, I'll go, but you, you have to change the way I feel about your people. I'll go, but you change my heart. You know, God wants to grant you the desires of your heart, but I think we misunderstand that. God wants to show you the desires of your heart. We have dreams that are really, really, they really depend on our opinions of what life is, of what good is, of what better is. And these opinions create these dreams that close us off to who we really are, to the realities of what God does in our lives, to the fulfillment of us. And now I find myself doing stuff for other people that I never knew I loved or I cared about so much for. Guys, it's the same thing in your life. God has given you passions and desires, but you're blind to them because of your opinions. Be them political or religious or personal. You want to clear yourself off your, your dumb ideas? Spend time with your father. Spend time with your king. See your king's heart. See his kingdom. He will walk you across his lands and he will he'll show you, hey buddy, this is all yours. It's for the taking. I used to think, man, it'd be pretty awesome to, you know, go back and uh into the old testament and deliver a classic old testament whooping to people, you know. I don't know if it's just me, but I'm sure Pastor Roger feels that sometimes. Sometimes you're counseling people, you're talking with people, and you're just thinking, Lord, just say the word. I'll slap him. I'll slap him in the face. <laughs> or if a kick is holier, I'll do that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's why I like Pastor Roger. <laughs> Guys, <laughs> we haven't changed much. From our, uh, from our Old Testament partners. We're stiff-necked people. We're hard to deal with. But our king is strong. He knows how to snap our necks. You really want to be happy if you suffer from depression, you suffer from a year, you don't know what you want to do with your life? Spend time with the king. You will learn what true passion is. I used to think it was super awesome. <clears throat> on the football field to just slam that quarter back into the ground like an unwanted red-headed stepchild. <laughs> it was just so fun, you know? You just you grab that person, you just slam him on the floor, and you can hear their body crunching up against their pads, you know? Hear the wind just knock out of them. <laughs> See them just want to lay on the floor just crying. And you stand over them like, ha, 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 I did that to you. God puts different passions and desires in our heart. Maybe, maybe winning was one of those for me, you know? But he has so much for each and every one of us. Now, one of the biggest thrills I get in life is when, actually, when somebody else either comes to Christ or starts understanding things about Christ. Because I see this growth, this maturity in them. Like, you get it now. Come on, keep going. 
I, many of you guys know I was teaching that martial arts class and we had Bible studies and all that, but good grief, it even made me cry when I'd get those calls and these kids would ask me questions because they read extra chapters. Wow, did that feel good. God has placed desires in you that I can't reflect because I'm not that part of his image, but you have. You have gifts and abilities. Some of you, some of you ladies just have a knack for making a place look hospitable. Like, you actually want to live there. You know, sometimes I go to some of your houses and I'm like, wow, this feels, it just feels nice to be in here. I don't know if it's the colors or the pictures or the smell of the food, but just, we all have different gifts. That God is just like, you are my royalty. I want you to share this with the kingdom that you're in. I want you to take it over. And it's just God's image in you. It ain't nothing special. I mean, it's something hugely special, but it doesn't require any extra effort. You don't have to make like a 50-day fast, you know, out in the desert, walking around, no water, no nothing, just like, God, please give me your power. You were born with it. It's just natural. There's nothing you have to do to, 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 to have that. You already have it. Don't make the mistake of thinking that your secular life isn't part of God's kingdom. Don't make the mistake of thinking that the pastors are in charge somehow of a spiritual direction for all of us. You are the royal priesthood. You are charged with this, with the truth. You've been given the power of the Holy Spirit to know what to do. The counselor, the king's counselor comes to you and he talks to you directly. I used to think, wow, it must be nice to have like lawyers be able to, you know, kind of like the godfather, the uh, conciliere, have somebody that tells you what to do and how to do it and how to do bad things so that nobody knows. <sighs> you have the power of the Holy Spirit that shows you how to do what is right, how to do it the first time, how to have the most impact in other people and your own life. Guys, you are the royal priesthood. And now I'm looking back at the Bible school and I'm realizing, God, you don't just want me to train missionaries. Because God wants us to do tent making skills where we teach people different skills like welding, carpentry, construction, uh, mechanics. And God's, God just opened my eyes to see, hey, I'm not just wanting you to help raise the missionaries and send them out. I'm wanting you to prepare my people, those that will send the missionaries out, those that might go on short-term trips, those that will support my kingdom through prayer, through finances, through involvement, through just being encouraging. And, guys, I, I actually get really encouraged when I, when I come out and you know, hang out with you guys, talk, and I don't know, just, it feels good that somebody else approves of what you're doing, you know? God wants you to do that with each other every day, not just with us. You are a royal priesthood. You're not a guy, you're not just a girl, you don't... You're not just a nobody, you are the son of a king, the daughter of a king. I think you guys... Me, at least I felt like I need to start acting like it. First and just realizing I have, I have a history that I, that I can be proud of. It's not just your, your blood history, your family's history. No. God counts your history back from Abraham. He says that is your descendants. That is where you come from. So you might have had some, some parents that quite didn't get how to raise you or to help you or to, to, to bring you up in life. 
But you have a king that sure does. He knows how to fight for you. He knows how to fight with you. He knows how to guide you. Because the desires you have in his heart, he placed them there. And he gave you the tools to succeed as his king. Not because you're smart, you're powerful, but simply because you are his favored son. He will open doors for you that nobody can open. He will close them when you need doors closed. Count those as a blessing. You know, that, that tire, that, that busted, that's actually happened to me. And it happened right as I was about to get into a major freeway. I'm so glad. I remember thinking, thank you, God, that this didn't happen beforehand. God uses all things together for good to those that love him and are called according to his purpose. If you've been born again, you are his blood. Dear God, I give you thanks. I give you thanks that we are your sons and daughters, Lord. I give you thanks that you died, you paid the highest price so that we could share that privilege. I ask God that you help us see this identity that we have in you, Lord. Not that the pastor is somehow our priest like in the Old Testament, that he's the only one that can connect us to you, Lord, but that we have direct access to you because we are your sons and daughters. In your precious name, God, I give you thanks. Amen.